There we go. Well, thank you, Heather, uh, for coming in. Just as a reminder, this is our first lecture in a series of Thursday Lunch and Learns entitled Hearing Her Voice. Uh, we have just sought to provide a, a place for people to come in, share some things they're passionate about, share things that they are celebrating um, and studying. Uh, and so first up is Heather Keefe with uh, the story of the bread. Uh, before we jump in, maybe you can share what ignited this passion? Why is uh, the subject of the bread uh, so important? Right. Uh, that's a great question. Um, let's see. It was probably back in 2000. I was thinking about this this morning. Mm -hmm. Like, when did that happen? And I think it was around 2004, 2005. And then I started thinking, wait, that was 20 years ago. <laughs> um, every time I took communion, I felt this nudge of, like, you don't get it. You don't understand. And I was like, what? I grew up in the church. Uh, my dad's a pastor. Uh, like I knew all the answers, right? That you're taught in church about communion and what it's for and what you do. And um, and so I thought like, what do you mean? I don't understand. It was, it was very odd. It was like doing a puzzle and like there's one piece missing. <laughs> so this nagging feeling each time. So I started looking in, I, I reread parts of the scripture again. I'm like, I still don't get it. What am I missing? What am I missing? And then um, I was like, well, it must have to do with um, the Passover, something about the Passover that's not in the Bible. So that's when I started trying to find um, information about the Passover. And it's there um, that I found in, in like the traditions and the symbolism of things that I didn't know anything about and things that in the early church or as a Jewish Christian, you would know, but as Jewish, as Gentile Christians, we've just lost over the years and in our culture and in our time. Um, so that got me really, really interested. I started digging into it more and more. And so if you're interested in the things that we talk about today, I think I'm gonna stand up. <laughs> comfortable standing. Um, there's two books that I'd really recommend. Uh, one is Christ in the Passover um, by the Rosens. Um, so I found this book at a Jews for Jesus um, presentation that was called Christ in the Passover. Same thing as what the book's called, Christ in the Passover. That was very, very helpful. The other one is uh, The Feasts of the Lord uh, by Kevin Howard and Marvin Rosenthal. Um, also very helpful and it talks about all the feasts and like we only have enough time to like scratch the surface of just the bread in communion there's so much more significance to um the feasts so um i liken it to um, there's so much in the new testament that or, and also the old testament that we just read right over we just don't get it and um and I liken it to say somebody writes a letter to someone far away in Asia, totally different culture, right? And you say, the children said the pledge or said the pledge in the morning. Like right now, each of you, what do you have in your mind? What? Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance. So you know what the pledge is. Where are the children? They're at school. What's their posture? Standing. They're standing and saluting. Saluting. They have their hand over their heart. So you know so much about that one sentence already. You even know the words to the pledge. Um, and to which somebody in another culture would be like, they said a pledge. What are what are they pledging? Like, are they pledging to be good children? Like they. So you're starting. Their mind is going in other directions. And so we do the same thing to things. To, oh, stay awake, my computer. So we do the same things too as Gentile Christians. Um, so digging into the Jewish roots of things can be very, very meaningful and can pull out significance um, that we don't even realize that it's there. So we'll go ahead and get started here. No, it's, I forgot, I'm not in presentation mode. No. So I'm gonna have to click on the slides. Um, so in studying, I found that communion is really, it's a hub, 
for all kinds of things. Hub that looks backwards, hub that looks forwards, ups, down, all over. So um, in looking at this, when was communion instituted? This isn't going to work. I have to go to presentation mode. It'll work. Yeah. So we'll see what fits. Okay. Uh, <laughs> just that camera, I'm sure. I just realized I have things that pop up. So, where was communion instituted? I'm going to go with the Passover. Passover. But during the Passover. So, when did Christ start communion? Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper. Lord's right. And so we have the Lord's Supper, which looks back to and remembers the Passover. So here we have one part of the hub. We, okay, so we have the Lord's Supper, communion that Christ instituted then during the Lord's Supper, and it looks back to Passover, um, where the Israelites, um, the, it's a celebration of the Israelites, how they are about to be redeemed from slavery in Egypt. Um, so when we look at the Passover and the Passover bread specifically, because that's all we're going to cover this morning or this afternoon now, right? Um, is in Exodus 12, 8, they're told to eat bread made without yeast, um, unleavened bread. Uh, so Passover also overlaps with the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. Um, it's seen as a journey kind of uh, for the Jewish people. Um, so for seven days, they were supposed to eat bread without yeast. In fact, um, leaven is to be purged from all the homes and burned. There shouldn't be leaven anywhere. No yeast. It's supposed to be destroyed. Um, and the repercussions of having yeast or eating yeast are quite steep, like being cut off from the people. So it's quite serious. So um, in Hebrew, hametz is the word for unleavened bread, which means sour. Uh, and matzah is the word used for leavened bread. Um, no, I have that backwards. Sorry, hummus is leavened bread. Oh, I have the unleavened and leavened switched. That's what it is. Sorry, that's kind of confusing. So hummus is leavened bread and it means sour. Matzah is unleavened bread, which means without sourness. So if you, this is a piece of matzah. You can see quite thin, uh, a lot like a saltine cracker. And you know, you know, leavened bread. <coughs> anyway, um, also how we know about yeast today is this like granulated pan stuff. That this is actually super recent, like World War II. That's when this was invented. Before that, yeast cakes were used. So what did they do in ancient times? Um, in ancient times, well, actually, first I'm going to use this, and we're going to come back to it. I'm going to take some. I have some water here. I'm going to put the yeast in the water. I'm also going to take some food because yeast is a living organism. I'm going to put some yeast or some flour very slowly in here and make a mess. But what they did, um, hmm, not working. What they did in ancient times was you'd mix flour with water and you'd let it set out. Uh, how many of you guys have made like friendship breads or sourdough breads? Yeah, so that's basically what it is. Is you, um, a lot of times you use starters. So if you don't use a starter, you mix flour and water and you set it out for like a week. And what it does is it gathers the uh, wild yeast spores, um, on the wet dough. And um, you can pass this around and smell it. Um, this has only been going for about two days. So you can smell like the difference and you can see there's some bubbles starting. You can smell the difference, uh, uh, like a little bit of the sweet, just flower smell. And it's just starting, just starting to get a smell of, um, of sour. Let's see, can I have someone? What this is working. We're gonna get this flower in here. 
Eventually. You know what? Can yeah. somebody do I'll it? Work, I'll work on it. <laughs> It usually moves in quite, oh, I'm sorry. You'll need a napkin. Um, anyways, so yeast is a living organism. Uh, it's a fungus, actually. Um, and so we talked about the ancient method of leavening was the sourdough method uh, where you leave it out. Um, the Jewish definition for leavened bread is actually flour mixed with water for more than 18 minutes. So if you ever see, like if you go to the store and buy a box of matzah, um, like this particular box is kosher for Passover. That means it's been made within 18 minutes, which is actually quite a feat. It's, it's <laughs> I've tried. <laughs> <It'll work. laughs> we'll just call it good. We'll leave well, it at that. Now we're making it a bigger mess. We'll just leave it there and hopefully this is going to be enough for it to do what I need it to do. So I'm gonna mix this up. So this will be an illustration for later on. I'm gonna put a balloon over this. A pink balloon because I went down to get a balloon and I was like, which one should I use? It's a variety pack. And I have all boys in my house. So I was like, the pink. <laughs> they won't have any use for it. Okay, we'll talk more about this later. Okay, so that is yeast, but yeast is also an analogy. Um, so we look at Luke 12, it says, Jesus began to speak first to his, his disciples saying, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Also in 1 Corinthians, it talks about your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So what references, what do you see it referencing as far as what is yeast? How about in that first verse? Be on guard against what? Sin. Hypocrisy. Sin. Hypocrisy. Yes. Yeah, so we see hypocrisy here. And then in that next one, we see several, actually. What do you see? Wickedness. Wickedness. Oh, sorry. They go in order. <laughs> Boasting. Uh -huh. Yeah. And wickedness. Sure. Yep. Let's see, malice, malice. wickedness, yeah. there you go. All forms of sin. So yeast is an analogy to sin. Um, so yeast represents sin. So just as yeast breaks down a substance, uh, causing it to ferment, decay, so <laughs> sin breaks down and leads to decay. In fact, we see in Romans, uh, the wages of sin is death. Sin leads to death. Yeast leads to decay. So there's a um, uh, similarity there. Also, yeast puffs up. Here, hopefully by the time that we end our time together, you'll see that yeast gives off air. It's gassy, right? So um, that's what causes all of the bubbles in your bread. So um, yeast puffs up. It... Um, causes something to look more than it actually is. Um, let's see. So if I take this piece of bread, you know, it doesn't look very substantial, does it? Like, especially when you compare it to this. There's like, there's not much there. But like, um, I can even hold it. I mean, that, that's pretty big, right? That's significant. So if I take it, smash it, it's like, oh, that's really not what I thought it was. That's, there's actually not much there at all. Where when you look at a piece of unleavened bread, like what you see is what you get. But also with what you see is what you get. Um, <laughs> this 
<laughs> what do you want to eat? What's more attractive, honestly? Like this, we want to eat this. This is so much more attractive than this. Um, in fact, uh, the Jewish people refer to uh, unleavened bread as the bread of affliction. So if you have to eat this for a week, you understand why it's called the bread of affliction. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, um, yeah, so leavened bread is not attractive or leaven, yeah, yeah, leavened bread is attractive and it puffs up just like sin, like pride puffs up. up. Um, that's a, a form of sin. So I have stuff all over. Um, but even though there's a lot of things different between leavened and unleavened bread, here's a really interesting picture. Here we have the uh, letters that are used to write hamet, which you read right to left. I had to think about that. I did right to left and matzah, again, reading right to left. Um, what do you notice about those letters? So similar. They are so similar, aren't they? Are there, is there any difference at all? Order. order. There's the order. The order is different. Yes. What else? Uh, in the pay. Yes. So what she's referring to is there's that gap. So we see this letter, um, what would that looks kind of like there's two letters that kind of look like a table one's closed in one's got this open gap to it um uh they look a lot the same but they're different let me say so these are the letters so again going right to left uh this letter is het the one that looks like a table then mem makes the m sound and sadi makes it sound and for matzah, we again have a mem, just like there is in hamet. Starts with a mem, then it's sadi, and it ends with a letter called hey, which makes kind of like a silent H sound. Or like so. Um, so they have the same letters except for the het and hey, which are very similar, except for hey has that gap. Um, so in uh there's did I go the Jewish belief there is that K has a window to heaven. That's that broken piece. They call it the window to heaven. And it represents humility. It represents being broken and open to God. Um, Het, on the other hand, is it's closed. So it's closed in and it's more self-centered. And um, as you also pointed out, the order is different. If we look at that order again, tell me again, looking right to left, where's the het in comments? First. It's first. Where's the hey in mas? Yes. It's last. Again, a beautiful example of humility uh, that it, um, <clears throat> yeah, it goes last. Um, so when we think about the bread, um, and hummus and matzah, specifically in this case with the, the open window there in K, we realize that Christ is our window to heaven. It's because Christ came to earth and lived and died that we know what God is like. Um, so he is our window to heaven, and he also is our perfect example of humility and what humility looks like. Um, so in talking about what humility looks like, what does matzah look like? Uh, I'm going to pass around this plate of matzah. Here's a picture of it. You can feel free to take a piece, pass it on. So matzah is a perfect picture of Christ as well. So we talked about that window to heaven. Also, we talked about how unleavened bread 
represent sin. Uh, no, leavened bread. Leavened bread represents sin, and unleavened bread would represent having no sin. So Christ had no sin. So how is unleavened bread a picture of Christ? So if you take a look at your piece of matzah, what are some things that you see or notice about the characteristics of it? The holes pierced in it. There's several holes pierced. Yep. And how is that like Christ? Any ideas? Holes pierced? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I heard murmuring. Here's for our Thank you. Yes, own it, right? <laughs> yes, here's for our transgressions. He was nailed to a cross. They had the nails going through. He had a ring of thorns uh, placed on his head. Um, and he was pierced by a sword as well. Um, so he's pierced. Um, what else do you see or notice? The ridges. Mm -hmm. The ridges, yeah, it's bubbly. So what what forms on those ridges? Where it's popped up. The brown. The brown yeah, deal. brown marks. They look a lot like bruises. So we know that Christ, he was bruised for us. He underwent multiple beatings, both by hand, by staff. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, another thing that we see are these stripes, which these are machine made, but if you make it by hand, like with a fork and pierce holes, you, you see stripes, just like being whipped. And Christ was whipped. And all of these, the holes, brown spots, stripes, it's a perfect picture of Christ and what he went through and his sacrifice for us. Also, when it talks about um, Christ being broken for us, like none of his bones were broken, but um, if you break a piece of leavened bread, um, it's almost like, oh, yay. It's almost comforting, in fact. <laughs> but when you break a piece of leavened bread, it's, I don't know, when I do that, I feel like, oh, there's violence being done, right? It's, it's it's loud and um, it's messy too. Um, like all these things are were prophesied and and fulfilled in Isaiah fifty three five talks about the holes he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities the punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds. We are healed. Um, the brown spots, the bruises in Isaiah 52, 14, it talks about just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form was marred beyond human likeness um, and stripes. They, uh, Isaiah 50, verse six. Um, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard, I did not hide my face from mocking or spitting. All of those things happen to Jesus. And we have a picture of that. And we're supposed to remember this picture as we're taking communion. That's one thing that a lot of us have lost over the years in the change of time, the change of culture. And yeah, what does communion bread look like? I'm sure... Lots of us have different experiences of the type of bread that we bring or use during communion. Not that there's right or wrong. Um, and yet this provides a beautiful picture of things to contemplate as we're taking <clears throat> communion. Um, there's some other parallels too um, with looking at communion. Uh, Jesus talks about uh, that he's the true bread from heaven, the bread of God, the bread of life. So he himself relates himself as being bread. And we should think like, oh, he's without sin. Like he's talking about unleavened bread. Um, 
Also, Bethlehem. Um, Bethlehem actually means the house of bread. So, Beit is the word for house. Uh, Beit and Lehem is bread. So, here we have the house of bread. That's where Jesus was born, in the house of bread. Um, another beautiful thing is in John um, chapter 12, verse 24. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So here we have a beautiful um, picture of what Christ is doing. And of course, we get bread from wheat. Um, let's see. Oh, look, here we go. It's starting to inflate. So we can see how yeast produces air and puffs up. Um, and it will continue to puff up. <laughs> and the balloon will get bigger and bigger as our time goes on. Um, let's see. Uh, going off of that thought of Jesus as the kernel of wheat, uh, here I have up here the uh, traditional blessing, Jewish blessing, that said over bread. It's Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lehem Min HaAretz, which means blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings like, bread from the earth. And it's just a beautiful prayer because it shows what God did in and through Jesus. Um, God brought forth Jesus from the grave a he is the one that redeemed us from sin and death. And yeah, it's the power of God working through and, and providing salvation for us through Jesus Christ. Um, so some beautiful, beautiful symbolism there. Um, there's also um, some of you that have done baking and things uh know that we can leaven with yeast and we can also leaven using what um using other things such as baking soda baking powder it's more what we would consider chemical leavening agents um so in chemical leavening agents um Actually, the Jewish restrictions on those are even more severe than yeast, um, living organism, because the yeast is in the air that we breathe. It's everywhere. You can tell it because you set something out and it starts to ferment over time. Um, for chemical leavening, it's basically where you take an acid and a base mixture, and 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 when you do that, the reaction is quite rapid and forceful. I don't know if any of you have seen those uh, volcano experiments, science experiments, where you put two things in this. Is. So it's quite rapid, um, quite forceful. And yeah, we didn't do that. I think I made enough of this. Next time. Oh, <laughs> anyway, um, and so I don't know if, you guys have used baking powder. You'll sometimes you'll see on the, the bottle where it says double acting um, re, uh, baking powder. And that's saying that there's a, a, a reaction that happens twice. So there's one reaction that happens simply when it's mixed with water. And then there's another reaction that happens once you add heat. Um, so give that rise to your baked goods. So it's really interesting to me because I find that like this same thing can happen with people when, yeah, with sin in our lives. I don't know if some of you have that person that just rubs you the wrong way. They come in and you're like, oh, it can be a rapid and violent reaction of, oh, they just set me off again. Right. And also that double acting, like sometimes we can have a reaction, but you add heat like stress, and it makes it even worse. Um, 
So the same thing can happen with people, um, whether it's visible or just internal, um, something that we can deal with too, of sin in our lives and um, how it affects us. So let's see, let's go back to this. So we see that um, once we look into um, the history behind, like, what what was on the table during Passover when Jesus was doing communion? When we look into that and the meaning that it had for them and is continuing, um, it's a it provides a beautiful symbolism for our observation of communion. It provides us things to like contemplate while we're taking communion, right? So it shows us a picture of Christ, who he is, what he's done. Helps us remember he was humble. He was pierced. He was bruised. He did this for me. He did this for you. Um, and it also is a call of to into who we are in Christ. Um, so it says that um, verse in Corinthians that I quoted before, it tells us to get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. That is who you are. You are an unleavened batch. You are to be without sin. That's who he's created to be, you to be. He's given you a new heart. So live into that. And uh, so it's a call for us to remember who we are and how we are to move forward in him. Um, let's see. So th there's actually so much more that we could talk about um, with the um uh, just the bread, and then the cup, the cup. There's so much more um, symbolism and meaning for the cup as well. I'll just briefly share that um, uh, Christ pulled in some of the um, the marriage ceremony into communion when he instituted it, and um, the the parallels between the whole marriage process and betrothal and God's redemption of his people. Um, it's mind blowing, the parallels. And I wish we could get all into that because it's so exciting. Um, but um, yeah, but that will be for some other time. <laughs> we'll just talk about the bread today, but just let you know, there's still more. We just basically scratched the surface and um, yeah. Can, do you see this? I just noticed this. The yeast is all the way up here. So it's really expanding. And there's lots of bubbles. So, yes, picture of what we're not supposed to do. <laughs> get all yeah. bubbly, get gassy, right? We're not supposed to get gassy. <laughs> and all puffed up, right? Good thing you didn't get all of that flour. I there. know. <laughs> it, I would have, really, I would really be making a mess. Um, so there's more symbolism there in... Um, Scratch the, the surface for the bread. There's so much more in the cup. And there's so much more for the feast of the Lord as well. A lot of us, I had a conversation beforehand of like the Old Testament, that's done, it's over, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not. It's a beautiful picture still for us today. And it's meaningful. The feast of the Lord, everything in the Bible, God just wasn't like, mm, We'll have them do some things. Oh, for fun. They need some holidays. So we'll give them these feasts. Um, and there's purpose behind each one of these feasts. And when you start looking into the feasts of the Lord, you'll see that it's God's redemptive calendar for all of his people. Yeah. Um, so we see big things happening from Passover, big things happening for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Next is the first of uh, the Feast of First Fruits. Also a big thing, Christ rose from the dead. Uh, then we have um, um, Pente um, mm, 
Pentecost. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking Pente 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 yeah. Pentecost. Something big happened there too, wasn't it? What happened on Pentecost? Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit. Spirit. was given. Birth of the church. So we see big things happening. And then we have a season of um, where it's summer, where it's the harvest. And then the feasts don't pick up again until the harvest ends. And so that's the season we're in now. It's the season of the summer, of the harvest. And one day, those feasts will pick up again. And exactly how, what they're going to look like, I'm not sure. But if you look at how the Old Testament ones were um, celebrated, like it gives a clue of what's coming up for us in our, in our story of redemption as Christians. And so it's just a beautiful picture of God's redemptive calendar for us. Um, in fact, you know what? I didn't notice that. It says that even on this book, God's prophetic calendar from Calvary to the kingdom. So it's a good book. There's also other resources and things available as well. So I pray that this is meaningful. I know it's brought so much more depth to me in my celebration of communion. Um, yeah, I had a conversation beforehand of, yes, communion is a time of a solemn time of remembering, and it's also a time of celebration. Um, and it's a time to be in community for the body of Christ. So, um, right. So I think that's about yeah. all I have. Um, and that's it. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead. Uh, we're going to pause our recording and then we'll jump into some discussions from there.